Let us remain standing just a moment. I was sorry to be a little late tonight, but I was in the emergency room out there, and I was delayed a little. So before we sit down, I'd like to read a scripture here found in Genesis to finish up the subject that I started last evening. In Genesis 22, we read it this from the seventh verse. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went together. And the 14th verse again, and Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord shall it be seen. Let us bow our heads now just a moment as we approach the author of this word in prayer. Most gracious Father, we are glad tonight that Abraham's God is our God, that we are his children by the promise through Jesus Christ. Then if he's just the same tonight to his children as he was to Father Abraham, for what he was to Abraham, the blessing did not promise only Abraham, but also his children after him. And when that great and mighty one came, that mighty child, the Lord Jesus, he was offered for sin, for our sins, that we might through his righteousness, become the children of Abraham, which is the children of God by promise. Now, Father, we pray that you'll give us tonight the faith that Abraham had. And as we speak of the word, may the Holy Spirit confirm all that you have written. And may when we leave here tonight, after this prayer line is over, start to our different homes, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he spake to us along the way? Let him do tonight the things that he did before his crucifixion, that this Emmaus tonight might know that he is raised from the dead. And quickly we'll go telling others, truly the Lord is risen from the dead and has appeared to us here in Yakima. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Be seated. There are many are laying handkerchiefs up here. I do offer prayer for them each night. I remember in South Africa, one of the books I believe it was written by Chaplain Julius Satcliffe. He wrote the book, I believe, Prophet Visits Africa. And they had several big uh, burlap sacks across the platform laid full of mail. And the editor of the paper, the reporter, said, Brother Branham is very superstitious that he was praying over a cloth. <laughs> it's just they never heard of it, you see. And of course, that is part of the gospel. That's something that God has promised that he blessed. And we have a, a chain prayer around the world for these clocks. Some people get up at 12 o'clock, some 3 o'clock in the morning, and we all travel and pray according to Eastern Standard Time. We send those out from the tabernacle around the world. People get up praying for the others, not for themselves, for others, and others are praying for them, like we do here at night. And I tell you, you ought to see the testimonies that come in of the great things the Lord has done. Just speaking last night in the emergency room, there was a little German woman sent not long ago, and she got a prayer cloth, and on the, the it's a little piece of ribbon, I used to send a handkerchief, but when they got too many, I couldn't do that, so I just get hundreds of yards of ribbon, sit down praying over it, send it to the sick and afflicted. And this uh, little German woman, she got the instructions, and they interpreted to her what it was in Germany, how that you first call your pastor. And if your pastor can't come, some good Christian out of the neighborhood or some member of your family, 
Confess all your wrongs if you have it. Pray. Take this little piece of cloth and pin it on the underneath garment. Lay your hands up on it and tell God that you'll serve him the rest of your life if you that you get well. And then when you do that, then each hour at the old sacrificial hours at nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, and three in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. That's when I'm praying at the same time. And we go around the clock like that and around the world. And you just, God can't even order that. All over the world at the same minute. It's prayers of hundreds and hundreds of people blasting forth at one time. And this little German woman put that up on her and she called her neighbors, her pastor. She'd had arthritis for 20 something years in a wheelchair. It was kind of cute and sensitive, but she said, when she put that on her, she said, Now, Mr. Devil, you cannot hold me no longer, so just get out. Here I come. I'll be sure she went the way she went walking. <laughs> just that simple. It's just that simple faith. Is. And what I've taken these nights for to speak on faith is because people try to make faith complicated. If God doesn't make it complicated, it's us that makes it complicated. We're going way out there trying to get something way out there, and here it is, I hear about it simple. If you've got faith enough to walk across that floor, you've got faith enough for anything God promised. If you've got faith enough to raise up your hand, well, you, you've got faith enough for anything else. It's simple faith. Just apply with the hospice that I told you in the messages. Just take the blood and by simple faith, just like you eat, drink, walk, drive your car, speak, or anything else. It's just that simple. But when you go to thinking, oh, can I do it? Can I do it? See, then you're, you're going far away from the, from the main thing. You got to come back here to simple childlike faith, just to believe God, say God promised it, my possession, Christ died for it, and it's mine. And just go right ahead and believe it and don't think nothing else about it. Just it's all right, it's all over. And you'll get well. Now I know that is the truth because I have tried it. But now if you've got unconfessed sin in your heart, it sure won't work. You've got to confess your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept him as your healer, just like you would as your Savior. They say, is, salve, is uh, divine healing lasting, Brother Branham? Just as long as faith is lasting. Uh, when you get to a place that you say that you're not saved no more, remember, you are lost your ground right there. When your confession goes down, then your faith goes down. And now the first thing that Hebrews says this, that Jesus Christ is a high priest, making intercessions upon our confession. And before God can do one thing for you, you have to first confess that he has done it. He's a high priest of our, of course, King uh, James says professing, and profess and confess is the same word, see? Profess that it is, or confess that he is, see? Profess, I profess I'm a Christian, or confess I'm a Christian. Makes no difference. And then, and the woman touching his garment. It said, Thy faith has saved thee. Now, uh, these Greek scholars here would tell you that that word there in the Greek is sozo, which means just exactly like saved physically or saved spiritually. The same in translation, sozo. Thy faith has sozo, saved thee. Thy faith saved thee from hell. Thy faith saved thee from death. Thy faith saved thee from sickness. See? It's a uh, sozo, the same word. So the same faith that you have in God for your salvation is the same faith you use for your healing. Just simple, believe it, act upon it. It doesn't take any sensations. It doesn't take anything in the world but just common faith. You don't have to feel nothing. You don't have to. only thing you have to do is believe something. Believe that Jesus died, that you might be saved, and it's yours. Faith is so simple. The other day, there was some, I was walking around, and there was a, some minister sitting out under a tree. The Holy Spirit said to me, go talk to him. I went over there, and his wife came out, and a group of people had been here, and they couldn't get a prayer card, didn't know this emergency room, and they had to go back to see the grace of God. And then, well, while I was there, the Holy Spirit came down and began to reveal all kinds of things, and then people began weeping and going on. And I said, you brought an Indian with you. Where is that at? 
And so I said, the Indian, the little girl, and she had a fever and paralyzed her brain. And that man began to weep. He was a missionary to him. And he said, uh, I said, get the girl. We'll pray for her. And I said, her father hasn't got money to stay another night. That's what hurts me. I wonder how it ever happened. I, I, I'm going to have to change doing what I'm doing because I don't get in contact with enough of the people through these um, visions. The people in America, we've been taught too long, we must lay hands on one another. And really, that's exactly what my calling was to do. The angel of the Lord told me I was born to pray for sick people. It was me that questioned, then he said, by these signs, he would call them. I said, they wouldn't believe me. I'm uneducated, and they wouldn't believe me. He said, by this they have to believe, because you don't know the very thoughts of their heart. Many times, I wish sometimes I'd have had something else. For many times I stand before people who put their hands on my back and call me brother, and I know that's wrong. I stood with, even with people that stay and say, oh, Brother Branham, I've got the Holy Ghost and things like that, and no, living with another man's wife or some other woman's husband. You stand have to swallow that when you know different. It cuts and hurts. Don't never covet it. Don't never want it. You don't know what goes with it. A good friend of mine reads that sitting at a table of ministers. And I wrote to him, and he was a fine man. I met him, and I was just sitting at a table eating one day, and down in Louisiana, and something happened. I looked across the table, and I wished I would not have done it. It's hurt me ever since if I just wouldn't have done it. That's the reason I try to keep it away as much as possible, to keep from sin. And I don't, I don't want to have that feeling. I want to believe that it loves me anyhow. See, and you don't want to have it, and you don't realize what you have to battle against, knowing. And then what someone says and what someone means in their heart sometimes is two different things. And you hate to know that because I love people and I want to love them with the true love, not knowing what they even think, but that don't make any difference. But I, I want to love anyhow. And then, but the more simpler we can get, the better off we'll be. I just speaking of Indians, I remember my first dealing with the Indians, I promised to the Lord, to this missionary, when I prayed for the little girl and sent her home, if, and said, Lord, if you will let that child recover, I'll go to the reservation. I remember in Phoenix, the first time I got San Carlos, the Apache, first Indians I prayed for. I always felt sorry for Indians. They didn't get a very good deal. We know that. So that night at San Carlos, back many years ago, and we went over there and we said, Indian only. And so they were out on the reservation and all, when the sun went down that afternoon, it was beautiful to see the all sitting on blankets and so forth, standing and sitting. And I was in a little assembly of God's mission out on the porch, one speaker and one interpreter. And that woman, they don't have any sentences or paragraphs or punctuations. <laughs> the talk's kind of rough. And so uh, she was interpreting. Then I went ahead and I said, now, you people, I feel sorry for you. I said, but I'm just one American. I said, I don't think it was right to push you off out in these places and so forth. I said, I think it's one of the biggest stains that ever went on the flag. And I said, well, how would we like if Japan had won the war and push us off in a place like that? It wouldn't set very good. So, and you live out here with TV and everything, half starved and everything else, and send millions over the seas for relief, and there we are. See, so what charity begins at home, says the Bible, and to a real American. Remember, we are not Americans. They are. God gave them this country. We come in over the top of them, tuck it away from them by power, push them off out in the desert somewhere and pour us the land. So that's how I give them a little pension or something. There's about enough to feed one child. And uh, I always felt sorry for it. My grandmother draws the pension. So then I, out there that night, an uh, Indian's a strange person. He's like a mule. He won't eat out of a strange stall. So he, he sat there and he looked around for a while, and you could see him head down. You'll stand listening at you, but you won't know or think he's listening at you, but he's taking in every word you're saying. So when the service, when I got through speaking, I said, Now, I come to introduce to you someone who will give you the right deal. That's Jesus Christ. And I said, He loves you. 
and I'm here to represent him. The government and so forth can represent the nation, but me, I said, I come here to represent him, and he will give you the right kind of a deal. And then when I got through saying that, I said, now all that wants to be prayed for, no need you couldn't give out prayer cards because there wasn't a way of lining them up. You just have to hold a little place over here and let one come through as he would. So I said, now all of you that wants to be prayed for, stand up. Well, I left down in Phoenix with the Spanish people, and oh my, it was horrible they, how they would come in the line, thousands of them. And then um, I said, now the thing, I said, and I looked, and I thought everybody would jump up and run, but there was nobody jumped up and run. Everybody sat still. I said, did you say what I said? She said, yes, sir. I said, say it again. I said, everybody that wants to be prayed for, come up the steps on this side and cross this away with faith bleeding in Jesus Christ while I told you. And uh, so nobody got up. Everybody just sat perfectly still. Nobody got up at all. And after a while, the missionary went back into the uh, room and brought out an Indian woman. Well, I turned around and looked behind me, which I had not yet, and they had all these little babies and this little carrier they have on their back, you know, hanging along the wall. And there's a bunch of women in there. Here come one woman coming through, you know, with this little baby. She looked at me, and I said, could I have a hold of your hand? And great, big, wide wrist. And she looked at me a little bit, and I looked at her, and I said, now, the woman is suffering with the two birthdays. And uh, she has lacunae of the eye also. And the interpreter said that. And she turned and looked at me. How'd you know that? Prayed for her. The next thing comes through. Not because of immoral living, but the way she had to live. She had a venereal disease, unclean. But not of immoral living. And, so, and she looked at me, and all the minions didn't look at one another. The next was a little girl. And the mother was with her. And so I said, the little girl had a fever. And in the fever, it made her go deaf. She can neither speak nor hear. She's a mute. And when the interpreter said that to the mother, the mother nodded her head yes. And, and her father was one of the chiefs. And I tucked the little girl up in my arms, and I prayed for the little thing, her little hair, just as coarse as a horse's mane, you know. So I prayed for her and set her down like that. I said, look here, sweetheart. I said, do you hear me? I turned her head like that, you know, Done like that, look around, she them little black eyes looked around at me. I said, she can hear and I'm sure she can talk. She went, blah, 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 nothing like that. Oh, I said, she'll talk better than that. The interpreter said, her talk keep good now. <laughs> so she was ready to, all right. So then the next was a little cross-eyed boy. Then the Indians begin to watch. Next he come out, he had his head down, kind of backward, his little uh, patchy fat cheeks hanging out, hair hanging down his eyes. And I said, um, now, of the little lad, is it the boy who wants to be prayed for? And the interpreter said, Mother, yes. And I said, now, the little boy is cross-eyed. And so I said that, and the mother took that hand and grabbed him with a nap of the head and pulled it back, his little eyes sitting in like that. And I said, let me have the little lad. And I had a piece of chewing gum in my pocket, and I handed it to him, and he held it, looked at me kind of a while, looked. I picked him up in my arms, and I, thought, I said, don't interpret this. I said, Heavenly Father, please give me grace. But I might believe these real Americans. I said to the Holy Spirit, something that will give them peace and take them home to glory. Let this little one's eyes be open. I charge Satan to turn him loose. I looked in front of me and I saw a vision of the little boy looking right at me this way, his eyes, this is the Indian just sitting and looking. And I said, now, before I turn the little lad and had his head laying on my shoulders, if this baby's eyes isn't straight, then I'm a false prophet, run me off the reservation. If it is, how many will receive the Lord Jesus? All of them throw up their hands. I said, what do you think, Mother, to the woman like that? And she blabbed something back to the interpreter. Said, she said, if, she could, if God could heal deaf and dumb, he could make eyes straight. <laughs> Good philosophy. <laughs> so I turned the little lad around, his eyes as straight as mine. Oh, my, you talk about a prayer line. We had a stampede. <laughs> It was just coming everywhere. And I asked the interpreter, said, they thought first you were false, but they know now that it's true. Just one more thing. There was a uh, brother, Jack Moore. How many ever know brother Jack Moore? You ministers in Freeport, Louisiana. He's one of the Christian businessmen. You know him, he's there. And perhaps so many of you out there know brother Jack Moore from Shreveport. Yeah, look at the hand. He was with me, he and brother Brown. 
and there's a, an old Indian mother who was really next in line to come out of here, but this little Indian boy, about 18, little chunky fellow, he just pushed right in around the rest of them. And I had a prayer line from down the same car, <laughs> just all lined up there. Everybody wanted to be prayed for. So I couldn't make the little boy get back, and the interpreter couldn't make him get back, so the old woman was really next. And Brother Jack just caught him with the arms. Brother Jack's a pretty stout little man. Just picked him up and set him back. Well, next to him was an old Indian woman, looked to be about 75 years old, with a uh, broomstick cut off for crutches and rags wrapped around a stick that went over the part, went over her arm. And she was holding herself like this in the door. And I motioned to her. And she put one stick out like that and moved her foot and then the other one. I just took my time and waited for her. And she'd come up close to where I was, and I thought, what's the old lady going to do? And I seen her hair hanging down, the leather plaited in it, you know, and turning gray. I thought, poor old thing, probably raised a bunch of children. How pitiful. Wish I could speak her language. And she looked up to me like that in a little bitty deep set eye, turning kind of pale looking, gray, big wrinkles in the cheeks, and tears cutting their way down through them wrinkles. Oh, my heart just went out to the old thing. And she looked at me like that, kind of smiled, reached over, got one crutch, and put it in the other hand, handed it over to me, and I walked off the fat part just like anybody else. And I tell you, just no prayer. She didn't ask for anything. Her faith made her well. Now, friends, here's God's Bible. That's true. I have this very same Bible. This Bible you gave give to me in Houston, Texas, way back in 1947. And I have this same Bible in the God that wrote the Bible knows that's true. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I said, I'll pray for everyone who comes in the line. I stopped the discernment right then so I could pray for them all. And so then, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I noticed them coming by wet, way up around in here. And I said, oh, the interpreter, why are they so wet? said, they were not waiting to go down to the ford about 10 miles. said, to go out into the desert and get their loved ones and wade across the river with them. And they bring them in on everything. So I looked, there was a great big husky warrior standing there, his lips real blue and he's shivering. And I looked, there's an old man, him and another fellow had on a, a board and had a, a board laying like this with a cross timber on it, one up like this, and he had the old man's legs laying over the temp, the two sticks across this way, and two across this way, they had his arms, and he was shaking with palsy like that, just as gray as he could be. And I said to him, I said, Speak English? He said, Legal. I said, You afraid you take me on you like that? Nope. Said, Jesus Christ says, Take care of me. I brought my dad. Simple faith. I said, Oh. I said, You believe God will heal your father? Yep. With the brought him. <laughs> I said, Pass him by. Must have been his brother back there. Looked a whole lot like him. And Passed by, went by, laid my hands on the old man. I said, God of heaven, bless the old fellow. Give him the desire of his heart. Passed him on. Next one coming, lay hands on that one. First thing, I heard a lot of noise out there. Here the old man had the board on his own shoulders, going out waving everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Just simple faith. That's all. They don't, they're not all tied up with this and that. They, uh, they just believe. That's all. Now, may God help us tonight to have Indian faith. <laughs> that's right, to believe. God heals the little girl, it'll be a sign. That's why I went to San Carlos the first time. Uh, went over there because God healed a, a woman come in the prayer line, which was an uh, alcoholic, and the next one come in was the two burkers and two Indians, and they brought back the certificate from the doctor that about a month later when I was in California that this woman is dismissed from the doctor, her TV was gone. And the alcoholic had never had another drink. By the way, that woman held up her hand here the night, got saved. Are you still your sister? The woman that held up her hand in the back, the young woman? All right, that's fine. All right, that's good. How you feeling now? How's your husband? All right? Going on okay now? Fine. God bless you. Happy home to you. <laughs> her husband is healed also, an alcoholic, and, and it's, been, it's been glorious. To know if you trust the Lord God. There's nothing like it. Now, if God will do that for that home, He'll do the same for your home. He'll take sickness out, take everything out. God's no respect to person. He only asks his simple faith to believe it. God bless you. Now, we left Abraham last night. Are you enjoying Abraham? One time in the uh, 
of the street a year at home in my tabernacle on Job. And I got him over as far as he was on the ash heap, and I kept him on the ash heap about six weeks. The people got real nice, you know, but it was hard. That was where I was making my killing point right there, Job on the ash heap. That's when the Lord did something for him. One fine sister, she didn't want to hurt my feelings, but she wrote me there and said, Brother Brandon, you ever go get Job off that ash heap? <laughs> I think you ever think I'm going to get Abraham up to, to the mouth. <laughs> but last night I was aiming to come to the climax of it, but the Holy Spirit stopped me, and I'm so glad he did, because souls came to Christ, and obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, a little background, and my son told me tonight, he said, that is, is the finest bunch of people we've ever been around, and said, they sure show that they are long-suffering. <laughs> he said, you let them out so late. I said, well, oh, Billy, I said, I'm getting just as much out of that as they are, see? i, I got to be charged, too. <laughs> and just like uh, one of the brothers said the other day in this breakfast, uh, I believe Brother Hobson said, we ministers need to, we're always up against meeting, going to the hospital, meeting unbelief, and then the platform, unbelief, and everywhere else, unbelief. we got to get together, you know, kind of sit under the old ones. You know, I used to have an old minister preach a little while at my church. His name was John Ryan. He's gone on upstairs tonight. And he, uh, he'd preach a little while, and he'd want to grab me by the hand, shake my hand. One night I said, Brother Ryan, what are you doing that for? I said, I'm just charging the battery. You're sitting back there praying. I'm preaching out. So we have to charge the battery once in a while. So we find that God called Abraham. Was he a special man? No, oh, just an ordinary man. And was he a young fellow ready for service? No. He was a 75-year-old man before God ever called him. So you see, God's no respect of age or ability or prestige or God just calls whoever he can call. And uh, so then we find that God told him to separate himself from his kindred and his people, and, but he failed to do that, and God never blessed him until he obeyed exactly what he said do. Now, couldn't we not type that and make a message out of it tonight to the Pentecostal church until we completely surrender ourselves to God in obedience to all of his word? God don't give us the Holy Ghost and say, well, I got it. That's all there is to it. No, sir. He gives you the Holy Spirit for action or word or service until we obey hunger in our heart. There's enough Pentecostal people sitting right in here tonight to start a Pentecostal revival through this country here that would it would certainly do things around here if we just get the fire burning good you know and if the high wind blowing from heaven like a rushing mighty wind something would take place so then we left abraham last night uh when he had been turned back to a young man i'm not going to ask you if you believe that or not but i, I believe it myself but that doesn't make it right <laughs> but something happened to sarah and abraham we know that don't we something happened because he was sterile and she was not fertile and they were hundred years old. He was and she was and how would a man fall in love with a hundred year old woman? I just can't. Now someone said, oh, they lived longer than they. My brother, read the scripture there. It said they were both well stricken in age. They were old. And we find out that not only that, but his strength was renewed and she would come back to it young, beautiful woman, and Abraham had come back to a young man, and they were enjoying life, and remember, as soon as they left their career, Sarah became a mother and bore Abraham a son. Aren't you so glad that we're going to turn back? I don't know what to say here. I'm so happy about that. I know, I'll, I'll promise to let you out a little early, but something's on my heart. I just got to say it. Now, I want to make this clear before I say it. I believe that gifts and callings are without repentance. Uh, the Bible says that. See, there's nothing you do, it's something God does. See? No man, you, you say, I sought God and sought God. No, you did not. God sought you and sought you. <laughs> it wasn't you seeking God, it's God seeking you. See, that was the beginning, man trying to hide, God calling, and Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. See, all the Father has given me will come to me. Now, now notice, 
since I was a little bitty boy of about two, two years old, I started seeing visions. First vision I ever seen was in a bush, and a, the angel of the Lord was in there like a wind and told me that I lived near a city called New Albany. And I was two years old, living in the mountains of Kentucky, and I spent my life within three or four miles of New Albany, Indiana, 200, 300 miles away. And then started from there on down through life, and not one time has it ever been wrong. But this, I don't believe, was a vision. I want to confess something. I was always a little afraid of dying, even since I've been a Christian. Not so much as I was afraid I would be lost, but I, I did not want to be a, a spirit. And I always thought if we died, we'd have a spiritual body. And I'd meet you people up there, and I'd say, well, that's the people I preached to down at the Yakima. Oh, my, I wish I had a hand to shake them, but my hand's rotten in the grave. There's this thing. And we'd have no senses at all, just like a little white cloud, a spiritual body, a form of a body, spiritual. And I don't like anything that's spooky. I just can't stand that. I, I, I don't like that at all. I just can get away from that right quick. So I don't, I always dreaded that. I said, I hope I live to see Jesus coming because I know I'd return from there and have a glorified body. But I, I wanted to know as I know now, so I can meet my brother and shake his hand and have a wonderful time. I said, if I could just live till Jesus comes, I wouldn't be a spirit. I would just be changed. I wouldn't have that time to go through. And I always feared death because of that. About four weeks ago, no, I beg your pardon, about seven weeks ago, I come in, I come in off of a meeting and I was laying in my bed and I woke up that morning and I raised up and put my hands, which I sleep like that, behind my head and laying against the footboard or the headboard of the bed. And then, um, I said, well, I said, honey, you wait till my wife, and she's sleeping away. And I said, uh, I laid there a few moments, and I said, well, Bill, you're 50 years old. <laughs> Best I know, I was born in Kentucky where they don't have a birth record. And you know what my birthmark is, birth record in Kentucky? The year of the old stump going way up over on a hill. That's all they know. They say, when was that child born? Tomato picking time? What tomato picking time? When was this one born? Corn cutting time? What corn cutting time? Now that, that was a birth record up in the mountains of Kentucky, so I don't know how old I am, but anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm every bit of that. So then, um, so then when, that's what my mother told me, and I think she'd be pretty close to right. And so then uh, I said, you're 50 years old, and you haven't done nothing for the Lord yet. You better hurry up. Because it may not be too much time left. I said, oh, I hope I live to see him come, and I hate to be a spirit. I said, I, I don't want to get out there so I can't meet people. And I said, I, I love the Lord. And, and just then, how the spirit works, as I told you tonight, these on the platform are visions, but they're little minor visions. You're making them yourself. You're using God's gift that he sent to the earth, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works through a channel. How many know that? How many knows even when you're speaking in tongues, it's the Holy Spirit making intercession? And to you, who's been gifted and clean, so he can speak through you. Well, then he has set in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, and so forth. See? And he uses that channel. How I could stop here and tell for well, in the morning if things has happened. Now, and so then something began to talk to him and said, uh, just keep pressing on. And I said, well, I've been pressing on. And he said, the reward is at the end of the road. The reward is at the end of the road. I said, I believe that. The okay, who am I talking to? I looked around. I said, meet him? My wife. I said, meet him? You wait. He said, huh? And I said, okay. And this one I was sleep right now. I thought, Father, was that you? Is that you speaking to me? And you've heard the story of the possum and the little fishes and the things that's taking place down in the naturalist and the life and things. Just as we start talking, just the same as you hear my voice. And when the man come walking to me, on the first time that he visited me in a human form, he was not a vision. He said, I don't know what a vision is. The man stood there and talked to me. He told me he was sent from God, that I was to pray for sick people and needed to be. He wasn't a vision. He was a man. I'm, I don't know who he was. He just said he was sent from God. And he was standing as close as my hand is right there. And I looked at him, talked to him, talked, conversed to him, and this light was hanging over him, went down over him, picked him up to the feet, and he went out of my sight. 
and everything he said coming back to the past. This is that, you see. So uh, I know it's true. And the light, the scientific world, take the picture of it. If I die tonight, my testimony is the truth. The church knows it around the world. The scientific world knows it by research that they took a picture of it and a photograph and put it on with George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, on fingerprinting documents and of, of, of photographs and things, and he's kept it in there for about a week and said, I swear a statement that it is not psychology, the light struck the lens, the light was there. And said, this mechanical eye of the camera won't take psychology. Said the light was there. Paper after paper is taken. We've had it several times in Germany and Switzerland and other places where they've taken it. Scientifically in that country proven that it was a, a supernatural something, you know, like a pillar of fire coming down and does it. You see the reaction of it here in the church? That's just like it did when it was on earth in the flesh of the Son of God. Now it's on earth in the flesh of the adopted sons of God, bringing the church together for the Son of God to come get a bride. Amen. That's exactly right. And now, laying there, I uh, heard it say, keep pressing on, the reward is at the end. And I, I felt something happen to me. And I heard that song being sang, we sang it in our church, I like to hear the sweet harbor bell chime, it would brighten my faith and would vanish all fears. Lord, let me look up past the curtain of time. You've heard it, many of you, that glorious old song. And it did, I thought something was, I thought it was down. And I looked back, and there I was laying on the bed. And I turned this away, and there's like a, a hill coming down, right? From me, everywhere it's at. Remember, with my Bible on my heart, I tell the truth. What good would do me to say that if it wasn't true? What good would my preaching do? All my sacrifice and suffering, what would it do if I'm alive? See, it wouldn't do a bit of good. I don't have to say this. But I'm saying it that it might help you because it's the truth. Wherever that place is was another dimension. I could not tell you, but I was somewhere I could look back. And everybody's always accused me of being a woman hater. I, I don't hate women. No, sir, I do not. I, I like my sisters, but I don't like the way some of these modern American women dress and act and smoke and drink and carry on. It's a disgrace to the nation. It's the greatest fifth columnist we ever had is the way these modern women do when they when they can't even raise your baby by the breast, they have to give it cow's milk, they'll die in 18 months because of nicotine poison. And, sir, you talk about a fifth columnist, that's it. That's what breaks the back of every nation, is this womanhood. It always has been. I like real women, real mothers. God give us more real old-time mothers. That we wouldn't have so much juvenile delinquency if we had a mother stay home, take care of her kids, and sit about somewhere with a cocktail party and a little babysitter trying to take care of it somewhere. That's right. That's what poisons the mind of the children. America's rotten with it to the core. It's getting worse all the time, and will continue to get worse. There's nothing. I get my voice against it, but it's going on because the Scripture said so. It'll die in its youth, this nation. Now, remember in Revelation 13 when it appears? It always is useful. That little the lamb that come up. Now, so I'm was kind of a little rough about women, and maybe this is kind of done to hold me down just a little. And I have to look coming to me, and there was looked like a million women. They were young, looked to be about 20 years old, and the ever one was, now excuse me, sisters, for this remark, but the ever one was very young, had long hair down to their waistline, wearing white dresses, and was barefooted. And they'd run up to me and throw their arms around me and scream, my precious brother. Now, I hope that I have found grace in your sight, that you'll understand me. You listen to your doctor, I'm your brother. I don't care when I was a, when I was a sinner, I lived true that way because the angel that met me said, don't never smoke, drink, or defile your body in any way as immoral living. God in heaven knows I live that. But there isn't a man that's it's red blood and healthy that a woman could throw her arms around it. I don't mean the man would be wrong or think wrong, but there'd be a human sensation. But in that place, it wasn't. It was truly a sister. And there, uh, I looked and I said, I can't explain what it was. There was no yesterday, no tomorrow. It was now. They didn't get tired, yet they could shake hands, they could talk, they had a body, and just like they was here, only young. 
And I said, I don't understand this. And that voice that was above me said, this is like something like Jacob when he had gathered with his people. Just then I looked and man was coming over the group, just like millions of them. And they were running, throwing their arms around me and screaming, my precious brother. And my, you know I was married before, and my wife died when, that's Billy's mother. And that's the reason Billy and I stick together. I, she died when he was 18 months old, and his little sister was eight months old. She died with the mother. And I've been Papa and Mama both to Billy. And I've seen hope coming, working her way through the crowd. And I thought, surely she'll call me her husband. And when she got close to me, she, I could see her, bless her heart, black eyes, German girl, you know, black hair. She threw her arms around me and she said, my darling brother. I thought, I don't understand this. And there's another woman, a just girl there, put her arms around me and said, my precious brother. And she hugged this woman and said, think of it. He's finally arrived with us. And these men, they picked me up and set me on for a little place like this. They said, I said, why is this? He said, in earth you was a leader. And said, I said, I don't understand it. And just then, this voice spoke again and said, this is when you gather with your people. I said, when I die, you mean this is what I'll be? Yes, I said, oh, why did I ever fear this? This is wonderful. Oh, my, just perfection. That won't reach it. Suburb, that wouldn't reach it. There's no word in the English dialect would reach it. God knows that I'm telling this from my heart. It happened. And I would turn every once in a while and look back, and there I was laying on the bed. It wasn't too far away. Now, I've heard since I've been telling it, there's a man named Dr. Price that had a similar experience as that. It's in a book. And if anybody's got that book, I'd sure like to read it because I want to know something about it. So then um, he was a man who prayed for the sick years ago before my day. And then I, I looked again, and then it said, this is when you've gathered with your people. I said, all these are Brahms? He said, no, they're your converts. I said, convert? said, you see that woman that you're just admiring and put her arms around you and said, darling brother? I said, yes. said, she was a past 90 when you led her to Christ. So no wonder she's screaming, my darling brother. said, she'll never be old no more. She'll never be sad. She'll be that way forever. I thought, oh, if I only could live it over again. I would cry. I would pray. I would persuade. I'd, I'd do everything. If I had to push him. Uh, get everybody to come into that place. Oh, my, uh, people could only understand what it is. And I went on that way for a few moments, and just then, someone, when I told this about a few weeks ago, someone kind of made a little light of it. I looked, and I had an old dog. He used to school me, help feed the family. I hunted all my life. This old dog would catch possums, coons, skunks, and everything for me, and I'd hunt, and I would I'd sell these hides and I'd get school clothes and help feed the family of ten children. And so a policeman poisoned him when we moved downtown. Oh, when I patted his grave, I said, Fritz, if there's a heaven for dogs, you'll be there. And I remember my little horse, Prince. I used to ride him on um, going hunting, running my traps and things, and he had went on. And when I looked coming down across the hill and here did he come old Fritz. I see that tongue out. He went up and licked me on the hand like that. Here come old Prince, Nickard, but it, it, someone said there's no animals in heaven. And that's just all you know about the Bible. Where's them horses that come down to the Elijah? Where's that horse that the Son of God coming riding on a white charger or dip? When's the wolf and the lamb going to feed together and, a, and an ox and the lion eat straw together? Where's that going to be at? See, if there isn't there, sure they're there. God loses nothing. Certainly they'll be there. And then we happened, I noticed, and he licked me on the hand. I said, if I'm gone on, if this is paradise where I'm waiting for glory, I want to see the Lord Jesus. And that boy said, but you can't see him now. He's higher. Someday he'll come back. And then these ministers and people all stand around. I begin to recognize them. Then after a senior, they were my converts of people I'd known in life. They were young. I didn't know them then. You see, they went back to young men and women. Oh, I said, there's brother and sister. I, I was just so happy. I, I never was so happy in my life. And I said, if I'd only know this beforehand. And I, I looked around, and I said, you mean uh, uh, he'll come to me? He said, he'll come to you, and he'll question you on the gospel that you preach because you were born a leader. 
And then and I said, Well, will Paul have to stand the same judgment by him? Sure. I said, then if Paul makes it, I will too, because I preached the same thing he did without compromising on one word. And all them people screamed out, We are resting assured on that. I said then we'll go back to earth and receive a glorified body and live together through ever, forever in this condition. See, everything in the Bible is in a trinity. You know that. I said the other day, you're in a trinity, soul, body, and spirit. You live in a trinity. The kitchen, and the living room, and the bedroom. You might have eight or ten different rooms, but bedrooms and spare this, but you only live in three rooms. God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost in a trinity. And we find out the coming of Christ is in a trinity. He came first to re deem his bride, comes next to receive his bride, come next with his bride as king and queen to reign through the millennium. You know that. Everything is in a trinity. And we are in a trinity. We have a mortal body, a glorified body, uh, uh, I mean a celestial body, and then a glorified body. Three stages brings us back to our perfection again, like in Eden. And then I said, well, I'm assured of that. And just then a voice said, all that you ever loved and all that ever loved you, God has given you. And I felt something happen to me. And I said, surely I don't have to go back. And I felt it a little closer. And I turned and I looked back towards my body and I see myself move on the bed. In a few minutes, I was back. Brother, sister, that done something to me. I realize now that if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting, uh, a body waiting. And that I think now to coincide with what Abraham and Sarah had received that type of body, just a comment or two, then to the context of my message. And then we'll start to travel. God had showed in Sarah and Abraham here exactly what he was going to do to all of Abraham and Sarah's seed. All the seed of Abraham should be that way. And here on earth, he brought them back to a young man and a young woman. And I told that story just as exactly as close as I know how it happened. And I, it was, I don't, don't, let's call it a vision, because if I would say that it was a little translation there, if it was a vision, I'd never had anything like it. Now, I'm not trying to impersonate the great St. Paul, because I don't, I've seen too much of that in my life, carnal comparison. But say it was a little translation, I went to the first heaven, and if it's that way in the first heaven, what did Paul see when he went to the third? Ah, no wonder he said, ah, it's not seen, your ears not heard. It was that glorious in this heaven here, when you go into the third heaven, what must that brother have seen? Now, now immediately after that, after they had come back, God renewed them. He made them a young man and a woman. He started them new. They were both fertile at that time. Then they bore the little boy which was called Isaac. Abraham circumcised him the eighth day and had a feast and when they weaned him and so forth. And then we find out that he grows to the age of about, let's see, about 12 years old. Just a pretty little Jewish boy with black curly hair and little black eyes. And how that father and mother must have cherished that little lad. And one night the Lord woke Abraham up and he said, Abraham, now let me just stop there. He called Abraham, but I want to say this, this is the scripture, but it certainly will blend with the scripture. Abraham, I want to show your seed from hereafter that what a man will do when he really trusts me. I know I promised you this boy 25 years ago, and you didn't stagger with unbelief at my promise, but you believed it. Now, I want to make the people down in Yakima and different places where this gospel will be preached to know that I keep my word. I'm going to give you a double try of it to show that the people who accept my word, no matter what comes or goes, they must hold on to my word. Now, I give you this son. Now I want you to take that son up on top of a certain mountain that I'll tell you. I'm going to make out of you, uh, out of your seed here, a mighty nation out of this boy. And I'm going to make also all the nations of the earth. And you're going to be the father of many nations. And now I want you to take the only hope that you have of ever me keeping my promise for you to be a father of nations. I want you to take him up on top of the mountain and kill him. Destroy everything that gives an evidence that you're going to have it. Oh, I hope you get that. Then 
course, poor old Abraham, he didn't want to wake up Sarah and tell her about it, so he got up early and tucked the little boy and the two servants and the little mule, and he chopped the wood and put it in the sack or something and took off into the wilderness. Now, any ordinary man, when I was on patrol for seven years, I had to walk average 32 miles a day through the wilderness, and we got gasoline feet in these days. That man had to walk everywhere they went. An ordinary man ought to say, ought to walk 25 miles a day. Look for things that you don't see with your eyes. You don't see with your eye anyhow. You see with your heart, you look with your eye. So, standing at that door of faith, look what Jesus said here. Let me read here. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in good. Look at our churches. We used to be down on the alley. We used to be on the corner with the tambourine. But now we got some of the best dealings in the country. Sometimes some of the best polished scholars in the pulpit. Because thou sayest that I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not that you are poor, wretched, naked, blind, and don't know it. Now, if I seen a man on the street that was poor, and he didn't even have any clothes on, and he was blind. And if I could go to him and talk to him about it and say, Sir, do you realize that you're naked? Oh, am I, sir? Yes, come in here. I'll give you some clothes. But what if that man is naked, miserable, poor, and blind, and don't know it? That's a delinquent person. That's a mental deficiency. And the church has become a spiritual deficiency. They don't realize that God is shaking every gift before the church, and they don't recognize it. Blind and don't know it. Think of it. Naked, a naked person, a blind person, poor and miserable and wretched, and don't know it. That's pathetic. And Jesus said the church should be that way, and this lady will see it age and it's here. I'm so-and-so, I belong to this denomination, I'm as good as you are. But brother, he said, counsel me and buy white raiment. White raiment in the Bible is called the righteousness of saints. Buy me white raiment. Buy me gold tried in the fire. The fire of Calvary. Buy me gold, the holy oil of God poured out. Buy that kind of gold. By the righteousness of the saints, that thou may be his. Now look, and buy for me some eye salve for your eyes. Oh my. Buy some salve from me that'll open your eyes. So what's going on around us? Oh God, I wish I had some way that I could get the church to see it. Buy save. Save is a hard oil. And oil is the Holy Spirit. Let me oil your eyes that you can see that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let you see that the promises that are made for the last days is here. Buy for me save. We were kids raised very poor. My grandpa was a hunter. A famous hunter going throughout the country for hunting. And when the weather got bad, he used to trap. And when he trapped, he used to trap uh, fur bearing animals. And he had dogs and he caught coons, raccoons. I guess you have them here in Washington? Raccoons. And he used to take those coons and we would eat the meat, sell the hide. We wasted nothing. And the grease was a cure-all at our house. He'd have a cup full of coon grease. If one of the kids got sick, drop a couple, drop some turpentine on it for a bad cold and swallow it. I don't know how we lived, but we did it. But it was a cure-all. If somebody got a bruise, they'd put coon grease on it. A headache, they'd rub coon grease across your head. And we had to sleep upstairs. There's a little two-room house that mother and dad and Five of us children before the others come, we 
step upstairs, the boy. Pop and Mom, there's no floor in it, all dirt floor. Had a stump cut off for a table. And then they, in the room there, they had a, a bed built out of a straw stick on it with a shuck pillow. Daddy used to have a shaving brush made out of shuck. We were way up in the mountains. My grandmother died at 110 years old and never seen a train in her life. Only seen one car, and I brought it up there, and it take me all day long to travel four miles, putting rocks in the creek so I could get it up there. All the neighbors standing out, never seen such a thing in their life. When I brought this little 26 Chevrolet up through those mountains, I got stuck down there, and I asked the man if he'd take his horse to fly, and said, my mare, if you get her close there, he'd tear that thing to pieces. She never seen anything like that. So we were poor. And then we had cut out a couple of saplings and we had an upstairs when the family got kind of big, a log. Big crack in the logs where the chink mud had fell out. Old clapboard shingles put on the light of the moon that turned up. Lay there at night time and mom would put a feather tick over the top of us in the winter time. And then she'd put all the old coats and things we had and had a piece of canvas where if it rained, we just duck under that canvas like a rabbit. If it rained or snowed, and you can lay there and count the stars anytime. And it'd come up a cold spell, and if we didn't get under that canvas, we'd get cold in our eyes. And there would, Mom called it matter. I don't know what it is, but it'd stick our eyes together. And I'd have to get up in the morning, make the fire, come down these two saplings with sticks across them, and make the fire in an old chunk stove. And so then, Mama would call me in the morning and she'd say, Billy, bless her old heart. I'd say, yes, Mama. She'd say, come on down, it's four o'clock. Your daddy's got to leave. And I'd try to get up, me and my brother, and our eyes would be full of matter, all stuck together, the cold in it. I'd say, Mama, can't see. Call Edward, your brother. I say, you can't see either, Mama. His eyes are stuck together. Mama would go out to the little step stove in the kitchen, setting up on some chunks, and she would uh, make the fire and go over and get the coon grease can, set it on the stove and get it hot. She'd come up there and massage our eyes with that coon grease. It worked good. We was able to see after she oiled up her eyes with coon grease. Brother, We've had a lot of spiritual draft, a lot of coldness to struck the church. It'll take more than coon breeze to open my eyes. It'll take God's Holy Spirit, His eyes have, will open the eyes. We've had so much theology in the days of miracles just past. There is no such as this thing as divine healing. It's only mental telepathy. Don't hear nothing about it. Don't you have them in your town? There's this, that, the other. It'll take more than coon breeze to open my eyes. It's had that kind of a draft to hit it. But God's got grease that'll do it. Yes, sir, it'll do it. Then when you open your eyes, you'll be like Gehazi was with uh, Elijah Dawson. You remember that night the old prophet went down there and slept, and the Syrian army would come over and surrounded the whole city. And Gehazi woke up with his servant, looked out, and there was just all around the city was just nothing but soldiers armed. And there laid the old bald-headed, long-whiskered prophet laying there asleep. He shook him and said, My father, my father, wake up quick! We're surrounded! We've been trapped! I can see the old prophet get up. His eyes was open. Got up and looked around. Yeah, I see him, but there's more with us than there is with them. There's more with us than there is critics! Looked around. Gehazi still had needed a massage in his eyes. Said, I don't see nothing but Syrians. The old prophet stretched forth his hand, laid his hands up on him, and these signs will follow them and believe, you know. And his eyes come open. He said, Lord, let this man's eyes come open that he can see. And God opened up his eyes, and around that old prophet, all around all the mountains, was chariots of fire and angels of fire. His eyes was open. We can only open our eyes to see this afternoon, sitting around, standing around, moving up and down the aisles, angels of God, the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, moving around to the audience, 
You see, there's more with us than there is with them. God, open our eyes, open our hearts, open every door in our hearts that I stand and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open, I'll come in and sup with him. Let's go back a little bit. Some 1900 years ago, we're closed. Let's put ourselves in a little room on the street straight that lead, led up towards Golgotha. Now I hear something coming. Sounds like a knock on the door. Bump, bump, bump. Like someone's knocking at the door. We go to the door and open the door. It's nobody exactly at the door, but yet it is a knock. But it's an old rugged cross coming down the cobblestone, dragging out the bloody footprints of the barrier. Bump, bump, bump. Oh, it ought to go way down today and you ought to feel it. On his shoulder it was rubbing. Bump, bump. Looked like anybody opened the door to that. A man dying that know no sin yet was made sin for us. Making a way to that bumping. Oh, God! Let that bump open every heart in here this afternoon. Bump, bump as it goes along. Look at him. They tell me he had not a place to lay his head. He said the foxes has dens, his creation, his birds has nests, but he, the creator of heavens and earth, had not a place to lay his head or a friend to stand by him. Can't you feel that knocking at the door this afternoon? He was doing that so that bump would knock your heart's door open this afternoon to let him in as God and his Savior, as healer, as king. He had one robe. He was wrapped in swaddling cloths when he was born, that's wrapping off the back of a yacht, ox's yoke. Didn't have no clothes put on him. And now he's dying with one garment to his name. Yet he made every garment, made the heavens and earth. He has got a seam in it. They throwed it across his shoulders. I noticed there's some little red spots on it. As I noticed that bumping, fading out, am I going to let it go by without accepting it? Oh, God made the meeting not closed till he accepted it. You know what he's bumping at your heart? He died that he might come back here in the form of the Holy Ghost and do the things he's been doing for you. Open up your heart, believe him. I notice as he goes on, them little bitty red spots get bigger and bigger until it comes in all one great spot. Satan was walking along there. He said, it can't be him. That can't be God. I questioned him one day and said, if you're the Son of God, perform a miracle, let me see you do it. That devil still answers that question. I asked it. If you've got healing power, let me see you heal this one. Jesus said it's written. And then I got him with the soldiers, Satan said. I got my Roman soldiers half drunk. I put a rag around his head, covered up his eyes, because, you know, he said he could perceive their thoughts. He wouldn't have to have his eyes open then. And I put a rag around his head, I had my soldiers do, and I got, had him take a stick and crack him on top of the head and said, Tell us who hit you, if you're a prophet. He was a fake. He couldn't tell us. And then I had them drunken soldiers to spit in his face. And could that be God in that flesh, going there with a gob of spit hanging off his face, a malt crown on his head? And I questioned him and challenged him to do something, and he never opened his mouth. That can't be God. So when they hung him on the cross, he said, all right, death, come on, take him. He ain't God. I see that bee of death come up, buzzing around. He said, no, that ain't God. God couldn't scream on the cross for mercy. God wouldn't do that. The high priest said he saved him, others, but himself he can't save. The biggest compliment they ever paid him. If he saved himself, he couldn't save others. But he gave himself that I could be saved and that you could be saved. After a while, that bee reached down with his finger and stung him. Anybody knows that a bee or any insect that has a stinger, when it once stings deep, 
It can never sting anymore because it pulls its stinger out. Death stopped its stinger in the wrong flesh that time. He pulled the stinger out. Now death can make a buzz and noise, but he, he can't sing no more. One of them opened the door and said, Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death can buzz and act like it's going to sting, but it can't sting a heart where all doors are open and the Son of God lives and reigns in a heart. Don't you want him in yours this afternoon? While the bumping of the cross is going on, that's him standing saying, I stand at the door. And the lady is seeing age and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open, I'll come in and sup. Will you sup with him? Will you make him Lord? Will you let him rule your life? Will you let him guide you and direct you? If it's against your thoughts, you, you sacrifice your thoughts. Let the mind of Christ be in you. Will you do it while we bow our heads just a moment for a word of prayer? I stand and knock. Look what he did for you. The bumping of the cross. If any man hears my voice and will open, I'll come in. And let him set me down. And give me a cheer. And make me feel comfortable, not misery. Not let him say, I don't want you in my private life. I've got enough faith. I don't need you anymore for that. Don't do that. But make me welcome. Set me a cheer. A nice, comfortable cheer. Say, yes, Lord. Here's a little praise in my heart. Here's my hand going up. Just a little stuff. Here's a little soup that we can sup together. Sit and talk it over with you. Would you like to do that? Raise up your hand and say, Brother Branham, I now want to him to sup with me. I want to sup with him. God bless you, lady. Some would there be another? God bless you, lady. And God bless you, sir. God bless you, young man. God bless you, sister. All right, someone else on the bottom floor before we go to the balcony. Raise up your hand and say, Lord, come in. I, I, I want you to sup with me. I want you to talk with me. I want to make you Lord in my heart. I feel you knocking. I, I want you to sup with me. Raise up your hand. Someone else that hasn't raised their hand on the bottom floor would feel that urge just now. Can you feel the bumping of that cross? What ought to make every muscle in you quiver? To know that he did that for you. And you want as much as raise your hand for him? Not as much as raise a hand. God bless you back there, sir. Up in the balcony to my left, would you raise your hand? Are you with your heads bowed? Say, sup with me, Lord. God bless you over here. My colored brother, God bless you, young boy, sitting there. Someone else up in the balcony, say, will that do anything, Brother Branham? If you really mean it, you pass the death alive. He'll come right in. Have you felt the cross in your heart, the fact you're in the bumps down the street, him trying to knock at your door to get in, to do something good for you? Raise your hand. Balcony to my right, up in the audience there. Would you raise your hand and say, Brother Branham, pray for me. I right, now, God bless you. God bless you. That's good. Someone, God bless you. Bless you. Bless the little one there. Bless this one. That's right. Someone else, just raise your hand. God bless you. Someone else? Say, it, God bless you back here, sir. Somebody else? Yes, the little boy sitting here. Oh, sometimes I'm a little heart that hasn't been pulled through so many disappointments and things in the world. They're tender. You know, the Bible said in Isaiah 10, a, a child shall leave them. Won't you raise your hands just before we stop now? God bless the young girl. God bless the little fellow over there. Someone else, raise your hand. Say, I now won't, I feel the bump. God bless you, young lady. God be with you. That's a gallant thing to do. God ever be with you. Oh, fear, it's the greatest thing you've ever done, honey. Someday when death comes, you'll remember that you did the right thing. You'll remember that before that time happened. Bless your little heart. Someone else, raise your hand. Say, I feel the bump and the knocking on my door. Brother Bram, I'm going to open the door and look at him. And when I see the blood there, I know that it's him. I'm going to say, come in, Lord. Come on in, sit down and get the best of my home. I'll make you welcome. I'll go tell everybody that Jesus handed my little abode this afternoon, my poor little heart. Not much, but he sure come to it and knocked at the door, and I let him in. The most important person that can knock on my door. Don't turn him away. Your head's bowed now while we're making the altar call reverently quiet. I'm just going to let it bump for a few minutes.
around the altar here, you that wants to let that heart door open, let him be Lord in your life. Come and stand here for a word of prayer just before we start the prayer line. Won't you do it? We'd be glad to have you here. The pastors are welcoming right in. You don't have to go anywhere else. They've got churches right there, plenty of them. It believes the same gospel. They'll certainly take care of, them, of you. God bless you, lady. That's the correct way to do it. While we sing again, will you come now? Let everyone that raised their hand walk up and stand around the altar for prayer, will you? Help me up. Rise up and come, huh? You're coming from the balcony. We'll wait. pick up the cross and say, Lord, I'll help you bear it. No matter what anyone else says, I'm coming right on to help you bear it. He remembers that. He don't forget nothing. Cripple even stand. 
Oh, God. Where can we go to when death strikes us? No one but him. You come because of something. You felt that bumping on your heart. Now, he's ready to take you in now. Our Heavenly Father, it is written, I'm quoting your word, quoting it the best that I know in St. John 5, 24. These are the words that you said according to the scriptures. He that heareth my word, which they just had, knocking at the door, and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall never come into the condemnation, but pass from death unto life. You said it, Lord. I believe it. That's where my soul is stayed, right there. You promised it. Ever promised the truth. Said no man can come to me except my father draws him. Then the magnetic power of the living God is drawing this afternoon. And he that will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Why? Because the Father has given it. They heard God drawed, and here they are. It would be impossible for them to be cast out. He said, I'll give him eternal life and raise him up at the last day. That's your promise, Father. They stand here before this audience of several hundred people. And they're making a confession that God spoke to them. You said, He that will witness me before man, him will I witness before my Father and the holy angels. Then you put their name on the book of life, Lord. I thank you for this. The moment they raised to their feet, you accepted their recognition. As they have cast it into thee this afternoon, Lord, they were sinners and they're crying for mercy. You receive them. You said you would. That makes it so. They were saved the minute they raised up. They're standing here before the audience with bowed heads now to take you as their Savior to witness before this audience that they are saved. Father, don't let this be the stopping point, but may they receive the Holy Ghost. The hour is close at hand. They don't need to do anything else but go to work. Give them material, whatever's in their hand. Some might sing, some might preach, some might testify. We don't know what's ever in their hand. Samson only had the jawbone of a mule, but he slayed a thousand Philistines. Shamgar had the ox gold. The Philistines is coming. He didn't have time to train to know how to fight. The Spirit of God come on him. He took the ox gold that was in his hand and beat down hundreds of the Philistines. David had a slingshot. Goliath had challenged. But God was with the slingshot. And here they stand this afternoon, Lord, as new creatures. May they receive the Holy Ghost. If they have no schooling, training, or whatever more, send them in the field of service, Lord. For your glory, while they have accepted that knock at the door. And while you're standing, and you that come up to the altar, even to the little boys and all, if you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and believe that he died to save you, and you accept him as your Savior, raise up your hand for this audience that they might see that you do accept Jesus as your Savior. To you at the altar here is what I'm talking about. That's it. Raise up your hand. That's the way. God bless you. God bless you. Now for a little farther blessing. They be instructed. The minister is standing here ready to lead to the room where we can meet in a room for prayer. Just move right around to the right while I make another call. Come right around this way, if you will. To come to the right, right this way. That's the personal workers. Follow these right now. Right now to the room this way. The minister and the personal workers. Come right this way to the room. Wow. The door is open. Go right in with them. That's what they're going in for. They've been saved. They come. When God spoke their heart, you raised up. They were God's election. God called them. Jesus said, no man can come except my Father draws him. All the Father has given me will come to me. That's right. So they've gone to the room. Someone else will want to go in with them from the balcony. It doesn't have the Holy Spirit. We got instructors and so forth that can instruct you and stay right there the rest of the day and night. If you want to, I'll tell us, you come through with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Brother, it's an essential thing. You must believe it. You must have it or you'll perish. Go in, won't you, while we sing once more? Trust, trust.
that'll be left. I have given them to them the best that I know how thy word, quoting it just as it is written, knocking at the door, the doors of the compartments of the heart, saying that whosoever will, he may come and drink from the waters of the fountains of life freely, without money, without price. Come, let us read you together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, red like crimson, they'll be white like wool. And as you look through the red blood of your son, we know it red through red looks white, and without that it's still red. Out under the blood, Father, well, there's no remission of sin, and they've come, many of them, to accept it, Father. There are many in the building here, I know not their hearts, thou does, that when I stand, if the day of judgment shall be today yet or tomorrow, then there'll be no man's blood upon me, because I have offered them thee by thy word, and the Spirit says, Come. The bride said, Come. Whosoever will, come, and drink from the waters of the fountains of life freely. God grant that there not be a lost soul here, but what shall be present on that day, saved and under the blood. Back in the room where those workers are working, God, I pray that you'll fill each one of them with the Holy Spirit. Give them the desire of their heart. Grant it. May they find fellowship among the saints now belong to some of these fine churches in their community. Bless those who are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. May he come graciously upon each of them. Help us now as we call the prayer line. Heal the sick and afflicted. And when life is all over, Father, the last sermon is preached. That I'll do someday. My life shall have to end here on earth if Jesus tarries. And then my Bible's closed for the last time. The last hymn has been played. Then may we meet thee, Lord, in peace. Come, Lord, now and show yourself alive to us as we wait on thee for the sick. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask it for his glory. Amen. Now, I believe Billy said he'd give a hundred prayer cards. I don't know what letter it would be. E. Well, there wouldn't be no more anyhow because we prayed forever medicinal healing. If he does, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Healing is the multiplication of cells or life. Medicine will not produce life. If they had let medicine make life, we pour it in a bottle, shake it, and the man come out. See? But we're not, we don't have it. If you go, now you say, Brother Ben, what's your thought about doctors? I believe they are servants of God. I believe that there is some among them that's not. But there's some among preachers that's not servants of God, too. I find more believing doctors than I do believing preachers in the supernatural. I visited a hospital here not long ago for a checkup before going overseas. I talked to the whole medical staff, and everyone on the staff believes in divine healing. Certainly. If you present it to them sensibly, one of the head doctors at a certain hospital said to me, said, well, Mr. Branham said, we push people back to dead, no pulse at all. And said, first thing you know, said, we realize this room of surgery, somebody's in there besides us. <laughs> right. I look, what if I broke my arm and I went to a doctor and said, heal it, doc, right quick. I want to finish my job. He'd say, you need mental healing. <laughs> That's right. He can set it, but God has to heal. God has to produce the calcium and stuff that goes in that bone and knit that bone together. There's no medicine that'll do it. Now, what if I had appendicitis and the doctor had to operate? He didn't heal me. 
He just took out the pendy. Who's going to heal the place to cut out? There's no medicine to heal it. Somebody said to me, he said, Brother Bram, one time I made a remark like that. I made it like this. I said, any medicine that will heal my hand, if I cut my hand, look, if I cut my hand and fall down dead, you could, you could just put all the medicine in the world in my hand and embalm my body and make me look natural for 50 years, that cut would be just like it was when I fell down dead. Sure. If medicine heals, why don't it heal? A medicine heal cut my hand, heal cut my coat. Heal a cut here. Well, you say medicine wasn't made for your coat or this. Well, what about my body then? If I'm if I fall down dead and you throw it up and embalm my body, what only heals? It heals the body. Well, you say life is gone out. Oh, that's it. Life, what is life? Tell me what life is, and I'll tell you who God is. For God is the abundant life. Exactly right. Your attitude towards it. See? You can't do it. So you, you must remember that, that God is the only healer there is. Someone said to me one time, said, Brother Branham, what about penicillin for the pneumonia, bad cold? I said, sure. Penicillin is like putting out rat poison in your house when the rats are eating holes in your house. It kills the rats, but it don't heal up the holes for you. <laughs> exactly right. Penicillin is a poison in a body that kills the germs. And that it doesn't, it doesn't restore the blood cell that it tore down. God has to do that. Certainly. So God is the only healer there is. If it isn't, the Bible's wrong. God said in Psalms 103, 3, I'm the Lord, and heal all your diseases. Amen. I hold my... When I, I was interviewed at Mayo, with plenty. They said to me, we've got the old Jimmy Mayo and the old Mayo brothers they had a thing back there in the office where you used to have there. They took me back and showed me when this Donnie Martin, how many read, readers died, Jeff? When Mayo was turning down and everything, and come out there to California, down out of Canada. The Lord healed him, made him well. And Mayo was turning down to John Hopkins. The boy was made normal. And they, I was interviewed on that. And they said, um, we do not claim to be healers. We only claim to assist God, nature. God is the only healer. Right. So doctors is God's servant. I can't, I, I, I can't heal. Doctor can't heal. Now he works by taking off a growth or pulling out a bad tooth. I don't deal with that growth. I deal with the life in that growth, the spirit. A cancer, it's the devil. The Bible said when the deaf and dumb spirit went out of the man, he could speak and hear. Spirit. If the, if the man's deaf and can't hear, the doctor says the nerves is dead. Well, why is it dead all over his body? Just like this. What if there's a transparent band around my hand to cut off the circulation? Through my hand, but become dead. Be useless. Well, now, you can't see that. The doctor only works on two senses, two of his five senses, what he can see, what he can feel. Well, now, if he can't see it or feel it, then when that band's released, then circulation starts back again. Just as nature, a lady had a spastic baby over there the other night in the emergency room. And I prayed for the little fellow, told her, I said, like a stalk of corn coming up. If nothing bothers it, it'll produce a stalk of corn, good and straight, a good ear. If a vine wraps around it, a clod lays over it, thick, it'll cook. Well, that's why plastic or anything else is there's something hindered it. Well, if you can move the hindrance, the thing will grow straight. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't see any difference now. That don't have anything to do with it. Not a thing. Pull the clot off the corner. Don't stick up right now. Just give it a chance. Lay in the warm sun. Rain must come out straight. So when you do the same thing, you just believe it. It's God. One, all life of that life is botany life, which comes forth by the S-U-N. But eternal life comes to the S-O-N. Is that right? Son of God. Say what you can do. Pour concrete up and down your sidewalk. Put the grass down. Where's the thickness of your grass next spring? Right along the edge of the sidewalk. Why? It's that life in there. You can't hide life. When that sun begins to warm that concrete, that little life will grow right on out, right on out, and stick its head up and praise God. That's right. You can't hide it. You take a, a plant and put it at the bottom of the kittle, turn the kittle upside down, watch that paint turn right around and come right back up and praise God. Right. You can't hide life. And when life's in the heart, God's in the heart, you can't hide it. Oh, he's real. Now, look at that line of people from out into the hall and outside. Well, now, you know, well, I couldn't take the sermon all along those people. How many know that? Well, about after four or five, I'd be almost fainted then. How many in here now, well, you haven't got any prayer cards, but you believe with all your heart that God will heal you? Get well. 
I'm not going to. See, the first ministry when the Lord told me to lay hands on the, they laid their hands on mine. Come in, doctor. Yes, sir. Now, if it just said anything didn't have a germ, it wouldn't show, but it does show. Just some trouble. You believe the Lord will heal you of it? I want you to see it. I want you to look at my hand. I'll take the hand off. Now, I put mine on, it doesn't be like that. But sure, now the mysterious part, how to know what was wrong with you. See, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, do you think if I pray for you, it'll go off? With all your heart? Watch it. Our Heavenly Father, let it be known that thou art God, and it's written in the Scriptures, in my name they shall cast out devil. I challenge this devil that's harming my sister in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of her. Now, you're watching yourself, lady. Before I open my eyes or anything, and brother that was watching my hand too, it's turned back normal, has it? Now, there's something happened, did you? You're here. Just very easy. Now, this lady, I'm not looking to her for a vision. Put your hand on mine, lady. Yes, sir. Shattered to death. Cancer. Are you aware of that? Now, she must have healing or die. Now, I, I'm, I just can't explain it. I, I, I just got to believe it. That's all there is to it. I, there's no way for me to do it. Now, ladies, if I could do anything to help you, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't do it. But I, I can't do it more than pray. If you and I will agree together like Jesus promised in the Bible, and you'll believe this with all your heart, how do you think that I know that she was suffering like that? By gift, is that right? Do you believe that gift comes from God? Now, if we agree now, I can make it leave you and you can see it go. But if, uh, if, I, if we'll put our faith together, and then if it goes, I can say it'll stay. Now, see, I'm dealing with the growth. See? Now, life in there, the lump will probably still be there. But after a few days, that lump will swell, get bigger. Then just let it alone. Think of a life, things like a little dog getting run over on the road. He'll shrink for a while, but then he's swelling it from twice his size. A lot of people say, I lost my healing. No, that's time you got it. We get sick, it's a piece of rotten meat thing in there. The heart has to purify the blood stream, so it beats the air and starts an infection, you take fever and everything. That shows that you got your healing. A lot of people say, well, I missed it, I missed it. See? Now, will you believe? Now, remember, when it's gone out, It'll walk in dry places. Now, if you'll believe, put your hand in. I want you to understand. So come up here close towards you in a serious condition. I want you to look at my hand. See? Now, turn kind of red, little white things on over. Now, that's not the mysterious part. Now, you take your other hand here and put it on this one. Now, it doesn't do that on there, does it? Neither does it do it on this. But now, put this hand on. See, that's what he's doing. There it goes. See? Now, if we will agree to show that God keeps his word and there's a physical sign, lay my hand down like this so that you'll see it isn't moving. All right. Now, you see this way it's looking. Now, I want everyone to keep their heads out because this is casting out an evil spirit. And when he's angered, it has to be forced out. Usually, I leave it to the patient. They want to believe it. All right. I've done all I can do. This time, so that the audience, this person, the minister, whatever more, would see it and know that it's done, the woman looking there, well, then let God be the judge. Now be ready. And as you watch, you watch my hand. Lord, the woman's watching my hand. She knows that something mysterious knows what was wrong with her. I pray thee, Father, in Christ's name, that she'll not hold this against you. But we're wanting the people to know that you're knocking at doors. And she's watching this physical reaction here. And I pray thee, Father, that you will make it go from her body. Hear me, Father, in Christ's name. Now he's dead, he hasn't gone. Now the lady's a witness, she's watching. I still feel it, just paralyzing my arm almost. Now be reverent, everyone. I haven't opened my eyes yet. Satan, the medical science calls you cancer, which means a crab. But we know you as a devil, a killer. Death. And death and life cannot exist together. I come in the name of Jesus Christ, bringing life. Come out of her, I charge thee. In the name of Jesus, leave her. Now let the lady be the judge. 
I've never moved my hand, but bless. Is that right? Now raise your head. Now with my hand laying on this table here, the lady's the witness. Now look, lady, so she'll see. Not like that, is it? Not like that, is it? Now take this hand, see? Oh, Jesus, see me, the little one, be Jesus. It looks like the whole audience is just becoming bloomed over now. Is, why didn't you do this in the first place? All is suffering with the blood to be sent up on your feet out there, and so forth. Thou beat us to what more. Stand up to your feet and believe with all your heart. All around, anywhere, upstairs, downstairs, wherever it is. How am I going to call them? See? Remain on your feet. Stand up just enough. Come believe me. Come here. Right here. Look here, sister. Thou beat us. You stand right here, too. All diabetics stand on your feet. You're going to see something happen now. If you'll just believe, have faith, believe with all your heart. All right? You believe with all your heart? In the name of the Lord Jesus, may my brother be you. Amen. Of course, you're crippled. That's an arthritis condition. Stand here. Everybody's got arthritis. Stand on your feet. Look here. All right, come, sister. Right here. Look this way on me. You believe me to be? God's servant, I've noticed that you've been sitting there enjoying those knees, that you had that asthma, but you believe that God's going to let you get over it? Yeah, everybody's got asthma standing on your feet. You stand up. If God can heal one, yes, and heal them out of asthma, that's medical issues. All right, kidney trouble. All right, all got kidney trouble, stand on your feet. All right, believe with all your heart. Come here, sister. Look at me. Stomach trouble, stand right here. All got stomach trouble, stand up. All right, look here at me. Oh, the whole audience is plagued with your trouble. You're in the Everybody's got nervous to stand on your feet. Everybody's got nervous to stand on your feet. Look there, how could I go through that audience calling all them people? But the Holy Spirit in here, there's just so much that coming at one time, I can't tell where it's at. Oh, he's knocking. Do you believe it? This is the moment. This is the time. Everybody, sick, stand up on your feet. Everybody wants to be healed. Stand up to your feet and raise up your hands. Come, sister. Take them, you lost the battle. 